Hello, welcome to Systems Medicine, Lecture 11. Uh, the lecture will talk about major depression. It's like a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> I see a lot of it. faces. I'm so happy to see. Um, in this course, we're uh, getting to the last uh, part. In fact, last uh, next lecture will be the our. Last lecture, our farewell uh, party for the end of this course. Um, worth coming. Well, we're uh, we have a one-week extension for the exercise number four due next week. Yeah. And uh, the final exercise um, is the exercise where we want to invite you to unleash your creativity. It's uh, simple. In this exercise, is in pairs, first of all. In this course, we believe that doing things together is better. And you look at the lectures and choose three lectures. And for each one of them, those lectures, invent one new question, just like in the exercises, about the same level, and solve it. And we want to ask that you please make the question clear so people can understand it. So just writing a clear question is not that easy. Um, uh, you c it could be a simulation, an analytical solution, a text answer, a database, looking at a database or something, whatever. You can invent something else. Some in the past, uh, students have added in videos that explain concepts in a f funny and original way. So that's also a possibility. Uh, make a wiki page, whatever it is. We trust you to be creative and to enjoy it. Uh, the grade is pass-fail, so um, any questions about the final exercise? Is that the same for the whole course, like hmm? the rating? Say again, please. The rating will be the same for the whole course, like pass-fail, or will it be different? Oh, no, the, the course uh, grade is a numerical grade based on the exercises. and. Uh, Average of the exercises multiplied by zero or one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and yeah, this. Uh, yeah, there, yeah there, there will be. This is exercise four, and there will be exercise five that will address um, the last lectures. More questions. I'm not sure I understood the question. So you said that, we, that people added videos or oh, yeah. web pages, yeah, so we should also give a uh, detailed answer to the question Okay. Yeah, so maybe I can explain uh, what I meant. So what we imagine is that you had it in a written way, just like you did with exercise. You write the question and the answer. But in the past, people were very creative. So if you, if you make a statue out of recycled... Um, <laughs> papers about the HPA axis, the uh, whatever, it's fine. Or in the past, uh, um, two students made videos that, for instance, uh, explained, explained a concept using um, kind of a, like a romantic relationship. So it was like a metaphor for uh, bacterial chemotaxis. Or something. So it was very nice. So that's another option, just to open up your creativity, see? So you don't have to. Make any video. I think the, the standard thing is a question and answer, kind of in a, just like you in a paper form. Or. More questions? Let's take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> um, I want to, I'd like to explore with you how to think about a, a disease called major depression. We think about depression, a lot of times, you know, in regular speaking, we think about, we maybe read a book that's sad and depressing. That's not it. Major depression <laughs> is a very serious illness that uh, affects all aspects of life. Eating, sleeping, studying, working, relationships, every day. And it's um, uh, extremely prevalent. It's, estimated 
the lifetime prevalence of major depression episodes is as high as 20% in women and 12% in men. Uh, that's a lot. It means every one of you probably knows someone who at some point will have nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> I've had major depression. Um, it has a it's a very, it's, it's so prevalent, it's so serious. It has a very diverse um, symptoms, but they include um, a kind of, a, it's not fe exactly feeling sad, it's kind of a lack of feeling, a lack of ability to enjoy, to enjoy things you used to enjoy. It could come with weight gain or weight loss, with a lot of activity, or actually loss, la la loss of activity, with the, um, Ruminations or la uh, difficulty to concentrate. It could come with um, suicidal thought, thoughts about death, thoughts about suicide, plans about suicide, suicide attempts. It could come with um, problems with memory, with um, overall feeling that life is not worth living. Uh, and there's different subtypes. Some types, a, a typical depression, when there's something enjoyable going on, you're happy, but then depressed the rest of the time. Sometimes you just can't get out of it. And it could last for weeks, months, years. And you can go into it and out of it. Some people describe it like, okay, I feel the water, I'm going underwater, and you go underwater, like that. So, uh, what I, the, the symptoms I described, uh, the clinical criterion are all subjective, by the way. There's no blood test for depression. It's a, we're in the realm of psychiatry, so um, if we think about physics and biology, then we move to medicine, and then we move to psychiatry, more to the realm of closer to humanities. It's like dealing with everything that's human, and in, in psychiatry there's really a, not yet a very strong unifying theory that's solid, and there's many theories in fact, and the medications, it's not clear how they work sometimes, often, and there's a, no blood test, like glucose test, if you're above 7.8, you have diabetes, if there's no blood test, you have depression, even though there are clinical correlates. So it, it, anything you can do in psychiatry uh, that moves towards the natural sciences is, is huge. A breakthrough, I think. Um, it's known that depression is a stress-related disease, so it often happens after a stressful event, like a death, a loss, physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, but it can last a long time after the stress is gone. So it's a stress-related disease, and indeed, if you recall, we talked about the stress axis, the HPA axis, cortisol. In about 50% of people with depression, you have high cortisol and enlarged adrenal, and after treatment, it normalizes. So that's one endocrine, endocrine is a hormonal fact that in the 80s and 90s, people really try to make a blood test, but it's not clinically, it's good for research, but it's not clinically good enough like a glucose blood test. Right? So, but there's like tons of research about, about that. What is depression? What is depression? What do you mean? What is depression? Um, like, uh, do, you, do you have anything to differentiate between somebody who's, who's in, say, who has a depression but deals well with it, and some, somebody who doesn't have depression? Is there a difference? So because you're asking, is there a difference between someone who, who's yeah, dealing with depression or? I mean, maybe somebody, you know, uh, like yeah. Just, yeah. So I'm just asking if there's yeah. some kind of definition. Right. So is there a hard definition? So the what's the definition of depression you're asking, right? Or how so can you define it? Maybe. So, it? so of course it's a category in psychiatry, and that means, like I said before, that it's um, based on the subjective um, judgment of a psychiatrist. And the way it works today is you have this diagnostic and statistical manual. I think it's five now. Mm -hmm. And here you have some criteria for depression. So at least five out of the following nine, one, a sleep a disorder, sleep too little or sleep too much. Two, 
gain or lose weight. Three, and you never had a mania or hypomania, because otherwise it could be bipolar disorder. So these criteria, which keep growing more and more, are the way you diagnose the disease. And of course, this, this depends nowadays on, a, on an interview, so on the patient's memory, etc. So there are a, attempts in the world to, for example, use cell phones to look when the person last logged in, that's when they went to sleep and then when they woke up, right? Because we all log in, not all of us. Maybe. So to use the electronics to gain a more understanding of people's more objectively of their behavior. And as I said, it would be amazing to have a blood test. But it's, that's, the, that's the state of it. And of course, there's sadness and there's, the, there's all the human range, right? So categories are artificial to begin with. On the other hand, there's the extreme of uh, people who are, are suffering uh, clearly from inability to function as they would like in, in a serious way. That's, so that's at one end of the spectrum and probably the whole spectrum. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I agree. There's no... We'd like a better, better criteria in all of psychiatry. Um, it's just a clear problem in psychiatry. So the Buddha, if you existed, was not depressed. What? I mean, say if Buddha existed, if it's a true story, then he's not depressed. So you say Buddha, if he existed, is like an example of a, 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 a... So maybe there's an example of a person we can say for sure wasn't depressed. <laughs> All right, yeah. That's always when we deal with categories. If in everything that has to do with human beings, categories are an approximation. There are, there's always a problem. So, but in psychiatry in particular, right? So that's why we want to get into it in this course. <laughs> See what we can, uh, we can, maybe what we can add, or at least pose some theories that are testable. So major depression, so prevalence, stress-related. Now, the treatments for depression are categories into me med uh, medicine and non-medicine. The non-medicine is exercise, okay, and, and we'll talk about why that could be it's huge, okay. Um, and not exercising is, is like taking a depressant pill, sometimes people say. Okay. At least 20 minutes for three days a week, is the, what I've read. Okay. Nutrition, a nice healthy nutrition. Again, can't say exactly what, but that's is a category. And this is an attempt to draw Freud's couch that I saw in a museum one time. A therapy. So psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy. Very much depends on the therapist and the relationship you build with the therapist. But this also helps. And then there's the medicine. Okay, so let's talk about the medicine. The medicine gives you some ideas what might be the biological cause. So I want to say, of course, as usual, when we don't know, the cause of major depression is unknown, like many diseases we talked about. That's the state of the art in medicine. It's a combination of genetic, environmental, and biological factors. Right? And it's definitely heritable, because people who have family members have three times the risk of getting depression, and the, more, the closer the family member, the higher the risk. And the, 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 the drugs that are uh, available, a lot of them focus on um, neurotransmitters. So I'm going to draw here a neuron. And here's another neuron. And neurons convert electrical signals to chemical signals, and they secrete these little molecules called neurotransmitters of which there are a number of kinds. And there's certain kinds of neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is it's a small molecule. It's secreted here. When it goes across this cleft to the next neuron, the neu that neuron has an electrical pulse and continues passing the information. And a lot of the drugs that are a effective antidepressants work on increasing the concentration of the serotonin here in the synaptic cleft, or dopamine, or nor, nor, huh? norepinephrine. These three kinds of neurotransmitters. For some reason, nobody knows, when you increase this concentration, you have antidepressant. Sometimes some drugs paradoxically decrease the concentration and also have antidepressant uh, properties. So you see how unclear it is. 
And the famous one, maybe you've heard SSRI like Prozac. And that's like, like a cultural meme now, Prozac antidepressant, is called selective serotonin reactive reoptic inhibitor. What does that mean? There's little pumps here that take serotonin back. So they lower the concentration. This drug here, like Prozac, inhibits those pumps and therefore increases the amount of serotonin in the, in the cleft. So that's a classic drug. It's nice because it has relatively few side effects. There's another one that does something like that for dopamine. It has more side effects. It's more effective. Is that nowadays, people come to the, I mean, well, you do the exercise and the nutrition and the psychotherapy, and then maybe you get prescribed one kind of SSRI, and then there's some side effects you don't like, and you switch to another kind of SSRI. So the thing that's important for our course is that this effect on serotonin concentration works very quickly, within hours, let's say. Because it's just a chemical inhibitor of a pump. And these things... But you start taking uh, this uh, Prozac, and it, it takes four to six weeks to work. That's very famous. The side effects are much faster than that. The drug takes a long time to work to start when you start feeling better. So what's this gap? Where does it come from? Why does it affect the neurotransmitter instantaneously for our purposes, but the mood over weeks? Okay, and what's going on here? So that's one question. Not why? I would say how? How, does, how is this time scale? And <coughs> another question we can ask is the stress. <coughs> stress goes away. But depression <coughs> lasts and is hard to go out of, to, go, to recover. So depression is hard to leave that state. So how does that happen? Is the same drug that affects stress and depression? So you say the same drug affects stress and depression? Yes. So stress, we've, let's think about stress as an uh, external event. So uh, you can say anxiety or, and depression. So those are like different, like volume for anxiety, volume drug. Or, so there's different, uh, but even though anxiety is one of these nine, there's different dr specific drugs for anxiety, specific drugs for obsession, SSRI also sometimes. So it's treated also for other conditions too. Sometimes. Um, yeah. Um, Okay, so our, our, our goal in this, in this lecture is to present a model or a testable hypothesis, let's say, about certain aspects of depression, namely, why takes these drugs a long time to work, and why is it that depression has this nature that it, something make, some stress makes you go into a different state, and even if the stress goes away, you stay there for a long time, and why you go back to low stress conditions and you're still in this depression. It doesn't, depend, it, it's, much, it's much harder, once you get into it, it's hard to get out of it. Yeah. You have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so if you got sick, sometimes without the cure, without the treatment, you get cure. Yeah. But in, in depression, it doesn't go away sometimes if you don't treat it or you have to. Yeah. So the question is what's called the natural course of depression. What happens if you don't treat it? Yeah. So yeah, you can uh, go out of depression if you don't treat it. And it might take a long time. Months, years. Definitely years is, is not a very surprising. And sometimes those drugs don't work. That's also very important to say. Roughly 50% of the people, okay? Uh, uh, this reminds me to say, these drugs, so there's a large large inventory of drugs and they don't work and you try another drug and if the drugs don't work you, there's another um, kind, of, kind of extreme therapy that's um, you have to give written consent and this is uh, electrical stimulation of the brain it's a large current you do that under full anesthesia and you basically get an epileptic seizure and that's very effective, but you also have to do it several times over several weeks. That, that treatment is also has a slow time scale. Can I explain myself? 
So, yeah. Apparently, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Time scale also holds in kids. But I, that's a great question because since we'll get to the tissue dynamics, maybe faster, I would expect faster and, and slower in, in, in all very old people. Oh, that reminds me, depression can happen at all ages, does happen at all ages, but it's also an age-related disease. The incidence rises with age. And that could be due, of course, to environmental conditions, your, change, your life change situation and your health deterioration with age. But beyond that, apparently, there's also more... For, proneness with age, with a kind of like this, an exponential rise with age, what do you say? Depression. Depression, yeah, so it's like one of those, it's like prevalent and then it starts to have this exponential, like we talk about age-related diseases. Okay, so that's a lot of things about depression. <laughs> Let's uh, since we're talking about depression, okay, so. I found a song about depression. I was asking my group songs about depression. Don't worry about a thing. No, 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 no. Every little thing is going to be all right. Also, don't worry about the final exercise. If you're frozen. Don't worry about a thing. No, 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 no. Every little thing is going to be all right. If your grant has been rejected and your paper has been ejected, don't worry, be happy. Don't worry about a thing. So if you're depressed and somebody says, don't worry about a thing, it doesn't help, right? But <laughs> <laughs> what does help people who are sick and with depression? What does help? What can you do as a human being? You're not, you're not a doctor, right? What? Huh? Chocolate? Don't, what you huh? don't add stress by telling them they're crazy. Don't add stress by telling them they're crazy. Don't Very good. Them the didn't work. Don't tell them that the medication didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> there's a, 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 in nursing, there's this really thing just to be present, just to be around, and also to connect, to connect the person with life, whatever that means is uh, just to be present and not really, not really to, to, to say much. It's very, very healing. Also, another thing about depression is social, social, we say social network or social ties. And family that, or friends that take care of you, also very important for the healing process. All right, so let's start getting bio more bi biological. So what we're going to do is we're going to You know what? I'm going gonna, gonna to draw part of, the, part of the answer because I think it's good to, or a concept like this. On this axis, I'm going to put in the stress, U. That's the input to the HPA axis. Stress U. And on this axis, I'm going to put in the adrenal size. So you remember that adrenal. I told you in, in many depressed people is large, enlarged, and high cortisol. Remember I told you that? So let's imagine that large adrenal is depressed and normal size adrenal is not depressed. In fact, the term is euthymic, which means a normal neurotic person, like what it means to be a human being, ups, downs. Right? Large adrenal, this clinical depressed state. So here's some stress. Adrenal goes up, up, up with, with stress, chronic stress. Let's say. And then at some point, something happens. And you go to this large adrenal. You're depressed. And now I take away the stress. And the interesting thing is, if I go down, I stay up. And I have to go down much lower in order to get out of this state. Okay, so people from physics know this from magnetism called the stereosis. This phenomenon where you, in one state you have to reach a high stress 
But then something changes in the person. And now, if you go, go back, the reduce the stress, it's a different person, you can say, a different experience. And you have to go much lower before you can return. So this, we wanna, this, is a, this is not an experimental graph. This is a theoretical graph waiting to be measured. But that's what, part of what I mean to say stress goes away, but depression lasts and is hard to go out of. That's, that's what we want to get. Did I explain myself? Yeah. How mechanistic is this? Like, why more than a surgical intervention have like, cut in half the it's, it's, in fact, <laughs> not a, it's, people have tried it also. Um, yeah, let's talk about the adrenal. Um, Adrenal does a lot of things, not only cortisol, it also it has several hormones inside, so it's, it's not so... It has inside, it has medulla that makes adrenaline, then it has the cortisol making cells, then it has all kinds of cells that have to do with um, some kind of... Uh, I don't remember right now, what's the hormone that, that's for the blood? Uh, huh? Remember? Antidiuretic hormone, what is it then? Yeah. But, Aldosterone, aldosterone, mineral, so it's something that has to do with the mineral balance, and the, so it's like, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we want to talk about how depression relates to the HPA axis, so this is a classic, like, a major connection between HPA axis, where, remember, the hypothalamus in the brain integrates many stresses, psychological stresses, physical stresses, daytime, secretes hormone X1 to the pituitary, it secretes hormone X2 to the adrenal, it secretes cortisol, and cortisol shuts down the other two glands. So, as I said, about half of people with depression have enlarged adrenal and high cortisol, and conversely, if you have a tumor that makes cortisol, you get what's called Cushing's syndrome, that goes with depression. Or you take dexamethasone, like cortisol analogs, and a big side effect is depression. So, Giving cortisol gives you depression, in many cases, and depression goes with high cortisol. So we say it's a strong connection. And how does it work is that cortisol affects the brain uh, profoundly, and it, it, um, an easy way to say it is that it increases the salience of negative stimuli. Which, what does that mean? The, for example, a, a test that uh, demonstrates this, in my opinion, quite well is you show people a face for a very, such a small amount of time you can barely see anything. And you ask people, is this a smiling face or an angry face? And if you have high cortisol, you're better at detecting angry faces, much better than by chance. It increases your ability to, to salience of a negative threatening, anxiety-provoking stimuli. So it's like you interpret the same reality more negatively, you can say. Okay. Uh, and it has m m effects on important brain areas. I drew here the hippocampus, so we're adding another, now we're going into the brain. This hippocampus is a favorite piece of the brain that's studied very, very deeply because it's connected with learning, memory, and spatial orientation and things like that. It's like a favorite uh, center of the brain. It's also one of the few places in the brain where neurons are born and removed, the campus. And cortisol, at high levels, kills neurons there. It stops, it makes their branches contract, which is reversible when you take away cortisol, it goes back. And it's reduces the neuron production rate there. So it damages this area. And indeed, people with depression have memory and learning defects. Also, it damages the prefrontal cortex, like the little adult in your brain that's saying you, you better think twice and take the, like, take the hard route. Don't eat the candy now. And so it, the cortisol weakens its neuronal hold on certain areas. And, it may, a high cortisol makes you uh, perseverant, which means that if like, there's a fire and I was running to the door and it's not opening, so normally I would look for the window, but with high cortisol, I keep trying the door, keep trying, keep trying, even though it's like, I can't believe it, it has the word. 
like Rosh Bakir. So the cortisol has well studied effects on cognition and neuro neurological effects. By the way, why is there depression? What's the, I mean, if, 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 if because this happens, is, is, it, is this a bug or a feature, right? So we think it's a, this is a so um, the, the research from baboons and primates, uh, there's a theory about the evolutionary advantage, you can say, of depression. Even though what depression means for a baboon is different from a human being. And so um, if for males, uh, challenging the alpha baboon, and you get, you go challenge and you get hit, then that baboon goes away and looks depressed for a long time. And the theory is that it's a way to shut down so that you change your behavior and don't get yourself killed. It's a kind of sign that if you have too much stress, your behavior in this abstract behavior space has gotten to a dangerous region. And what you do is you shut yourself down. It's a way of changing behavior, you can say. Do you explain myself? So that's what, that's the evolutionary, I don't, you can, it's, it's just a story, of course, based on this experiments and, and then there's tests where you increase a person's cortisol and make them play all kinds of computer games that have to do with losing, winning, and so, so you can like test that, psycho, psycho there. Um, but definitely cortisol does these effects on the brain. So HPA axis is, is widely implicated in depression and as I said, blood tests show that cortisol is high, etc. but they're not good enough to be clinical tests, but they're definitely a strong research indicator. We want to build a circuit to explain things like this hysteresis. That's, we want to get to something like this. Do people with uh, too little cortisol have problems at all? Well? Too little cortisol is bad. So cortisol, and I'm going right here, good, bad. <laughs> it's an inverse U shape. So at low levels of cortisol, you have what's called the Addisonian crisis. You die, very low level cortisol because of heart failure. But before you die, very f a lot of fatigue. And a good way to think about it is when you wake up in the morning, in order to wake up in the morning, you need a surge of cortisol that happens in the morning. So you, that's what it feels like. And also, uh, people who are sick get glucocorticoids because it, they make you feel good when you're sick. So you go, this area, increasing cortisol is good. There's an optimal stimulation. In fact. We think the, core, the HPA axis is kind of like a search device that gives you rewards when you do behaviors that increase cortisol, but at very high levels it punishes you if your stimulation is, is too high. So it's like a way to reach optimal stimulation. So you, do, you do not become completely optimistic or something like that? Yeah. Here in the middle? No, I'm less. less? No, yeah, yeah. It doesn't look like anti, like the opposite of depression. No, it looks like depression actually, here and here. It looks like fatigue and you have to take cortisol pills, otherwise you're in bad shape here. And it's lethal if you go in. And then in this region is where you have high blood pressure, weight gain, uh, cognitive, uh, cognitive changes and depression in this, in this part. So that's in, important to know. And uh, cortisol has two kind of receptors, one that binds at low, low concentration, one that needs very high concentrations to bind. And this, this one is part of this part, and this one is in charge of this part. So there's like, chemically there's two sensors for low and high levels of cortisol inside each cell. Okay. So we want to build a circuit based on what's known, biologically known, all known interactions. It's probably not the only circuit or the correct circuit, or, but it's a plausible circuit. And we wanna, I want to just uh, write it down for you so that we can um, uh, have like a testable theory, basically, something to disprove experimentally and also to just to write, to draw the graph like this, in my, in my opinion, is just like saying, oh, here's an experiment that needs to be done. Is it really a bistable system with hysteresis? Or maybe, Maybe it's a continuous thing, or what's, what's the time scale here? What, what happens to the mood when you come close to this? It like, seems to me like a way to operationalize what we mean subjectively by being in a state that's easy to get into but hard to get out of. Or 
And why is it some people have depression and others don't? What, is the, what are the physiological parameters that might affect that? Is also because there's many, many genes, but there's always, in these psychiatric processes, hundreds of genes of small effect, each one explaining fractions of a percent of the variance. So maybe, the, but together they make up some physiological parameter we can understand. So what's the circuit? What the circuit I'm going to uh, draw is written here. We're going to take the good old HPA axis from lecture four, and we're going to put at the hippocampus as a as, as the as a best studied candidate brain region that both goes defective in depression and as well characterized interactions with the HPA axis. And the idea is going to be that we take the HPA axis, which will represent with the adrenal, just to keep things simple, and the hippocampus. I use little h because we already use big H for the hypothalamus. Okay, so it's like. Hypo below the thalamus and hippocampus is like hippo is a horse and campus is like a, I guess like a racetrack is that what it's called hippocampus it's like a, a field horse field okay and what we're going to build is a situation where adrenal secretes cortisol and cortisol as I said before hurts the hippocampus less neurons less arbor and indeed what happens in depression is lower hippocampal volume, it's like 20% lower volume. L large adrenal, low hippocampal volume. That go goes with the depression. And hippocampus sends neurons into the hypothalamus that inhibit the secretion of X1 over there. So they mutually antagonize each other. It's a double negative loop, which in fact, minus minus, becomes a positive feedback loop as we'll see before, but it's a kind of a toggle switch. If A is big, H is small. Depression. A big. H. But if H is big, A is small. That's the euthymic, the normal situation. So it's either or, because of this mutual repression. Can I explain myself? Mutual inhibition is called in systems biology toggle switch. Large A and small H, or large H and small A. So we want to analyze this circuit. Uh, and I just want to add that stress activates the HPA axis. And what do SSRIs do? All these drugs. What do SSRIs do? The ones that work on dopamine and electroconvulsion therapy, what do they have in common? What they have in common is, among other things, mm -hmm. that they enhance the neurons in H. This is the drug. They make H neurons proliferate more and have more metabolism, even though we have very different ways of doing that. That's a common denominator, SSRIs. Yeah. Right? So that's our circuit. So you can say that these stress and drug are like uh, a person switching the toggle switch from one side to the other. Okay? And the way we'll analyze this is to make a plot that's similar in spirit to what we did for the inflammation fibrosis. We're going to make a phase portrait. And on this axis, we'll draw adrenal mass. And this axis, we'll draw hippocampus ma ma uh, mass. Mass means functional volume, combination of the number of neurons and their activity, and their uh, uh, dendritic density, and all those things that cortisol affects. And what we're going to show is a Okay, we will, we'll work with this uh, face portrait. Each arrow in the face portrait, remember, is if you start from a certain place where you flow to. So we're going to look for the fixed points here. And we're going to uh, understand what drugs and stresses do to this picture. So, so now we go to the equations. Um,
Um, so in the um, I was just going to use um, adrenal to represent the entire HPA axis. I actually have to write the equations for x1, x2, x3, p, and a. But I'm going to take a shortcut. And from lecture four, the adrenal is controlled by its upstream hormone, x2. And this is proliferation, and, rem and this is removal. They both depend on another number of adrenal cells. That's why A is out of the parenthesis. And this is, uh, this is the equation we wrote in lecture four. And now I need to add uh, equations for the hippocampus. Now this is a brain region. It has these, unlike the A cells that divide to make new A cells, neurons in this region, there's stem cells that divide to make the neurons. So this is the rate of stem cell division. And this is the death rate. And that's all great. So production, division. But I said before that we want to represent this arrow here, in which cortisol in increases the death rate of those neurons. So I'm going to write it like this. Now, I want to add another piece of information. This, uh, this receptor that cortisol binds to, uh, the bad receptor when there's high levels of cortisol, um, works uh, in a very uh, nonlinear way. It, it, it's, it's kind of kicks into action when there's enough cortisol. That's called cooperativity. So the effect here on the death rate is going to be like this. This is cortisol, and this is the death rate. So it goes up at, at some threshold. And the way we can write that is we can write it as uh, alpha zero, is, let's say alpha zero, right, like this, alpha zero, and jumps to alpha, and then it jumps by some number alpha one when cortisol is larger than the threshold. This is a step function. So when cortisol exceeds the threshold, you go from alpha zero to alpha zero plus alpha one. The death rate increases. That's a good approximation for the way this works. And it's going to be mathematically important not to have a linear function because I'm going to have to have a, a kink here, as you'll see, to get three fixed points. So that's why I'm adding this detail. Um, OK, great. And now from lecture, now we can go to lecture four. And remember, I'm just going to write down, because you can go back to lecture notes. What is, so we need to know what x2 and x3 is. Right? So um, from that. Lecture, you remember that x2 is, goes like the, in, the stress to the power one third, a to the power minus two thirds, p to the power one third. I, I know you don't remember, but you have to trust me. And the reason is this is the stress input. A inhibits x2 because it makes cortisol. And the pituitary secretes x2. That's why you have this po po power. But I'm going to add something. I'm going to add the fact this arrow here. This arrow is the hippocampus is interfering with the stress input, thanks to its inhibitory neurons. So everywhere there is U, I'm going to write U over H, which means the bigger the hippocampus, the less the stress input. That's going to be our change. That's how so I've incorporated that. And I'm going to tell you also that in all this case, A and P go together in all these dynamics uh, very, uh, in a very correlated way. So this is actually, so I'm going to write P equals A. And I get a to the minus one third. So x2 is equal to this expression. And we'll deal with x3 in a second. But what am I going to do now? What I'm going to do now is I'm going to plot here on this um, graph all the points of h and a where a doesn't change. What am I actually doing here? I'm going to only analyze this arm first. And then separately, I'm going to analyze this arm. What I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend I'm dialing H and keeping it constant at a certain number and understanding what's the steady state of A. And then dialing H to another number, understanding what's the steady state of A, and plotting all the answers. That's by saying the ADT equals 0. So that's either A equals 0, which is this line, or x2 equals AA. So this 
in order for A not to change, X2 has to equal AA, which means that this thing has to equal AA. And this thing means, this thing means that U over HA to the power one third equals some constant, which means that HA, the product of the volume of the hippocampus times the volume of the adrenal equals the stress divided by some number. So this relationship here is just hyperbola. The bigger A is, the smaller H has to be. So if I, if I set A, H at a certain number, A adjusts to satisfy this relationship, which is just this line. This line, H times A, this is a hyperbola that re represents this interaction here. Now I'm going to analyze this interaction, which is I'm going to change A, let H reach a steady state, and get another curve. This curve is going to end up looking like this. This is where the H dt equals it. These are called null clients. And they're very useful in order to analyze dynamics like that. We're going to get that curve, where that step comes from this little <laughs> downturn. And, um, and the important parts of these two curves are where they cross. Because where they cross is combinations of H and A, where neither changes. And that's where the system organizes itself to a fixed point. So uh, in this situation, um, they drew here, these two lines cross at three different points. And there's three possible positions where the system reaches a, a steady state. Uh, what, what is this curve here? This curve is, is just this curve. So when A is very small, there's no cortisol, then our equation is just C minus alpha zero H. And so H equals C over alpha zero. So you start here at point C over alpha zero. And when adrenal is very large and you have a lot of cortisol, it crosses the threshold. Death rate drops. And instead of alpha zero, we have alpha H dot equals C minus alpha zero plus alpha one. H, H dot means DHDT, by the way. That's a shortcut. And so you have here, you have C over alpha zero plus alpha one. And this happens at the threshold. So that's, that's what happens when you dial A. Very low, H is high, very high, H drops to low at some threshold. And that's these two, and, and combining these two, you get where the system arranges itself. Um, and when you add the little arrows, you can see that these two points here are stable, and this one is unstable. And you get a very interesting situation that this system arranges itself into a state where H is large, hippocampus is large, A is small, and that's depression. We call that depression because and another state where A is large, H is small, and that's, no, sorry, that's the, thanks, yeah, you were saying something, but nobody had the courage to say you're wrong, but like, this is, let's call this euphemic, which means normal, concerned, worried, happy person. So we have two states. Now we're going to look what, what SSRIs do and stress does in a second. But before I do that, I think it's a good point to pair and share, just to make sure you listen to each other's questions. So please find someone near you, next to you, behind you. Don't leave anyone without a partner. You can also be in three. And uh, ask any questions. Or, and also help me understand where I can explain better.
ושל סטנסר מיוחד שהם מתחלקים על זה. כמות הסטנסר זה פחות יותר קבועה, והם מתחלקים באיזה קצב שלא תלוי בכמה נוירונים יש. אז זה בגלל המבנה ש... אני אגיד לכולם. Okay, uh, so um, let's, let's hear just the, the question to this point before we start uh, playing with this very useful diagram. Soon we'll start playing with what drugs do, what stress does. Sir. Yeah. Yeah, this graph. Is it empirical or is it theoretical? This is a theoretical graph. And it's kind of, a, it's kind of a presented here in the, in the, as an invitation to do an experiment. Did that answer your question? arrow from the hippocampus to the hypothalamus, from the little h to the big h, right, you're asking, and whether it makes sense that the little h can stop you when you see a bear, such a, like, a life-threatening situation, is it good, or is it good? So, um, it's, it's, it's a fact that the hippocampus sends these inhibitory neurons into the, uh, little h sends inhibitory neurons into big h, and that's exactly where this, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, thing about your ability to learn and remember. So you see a bear, and, but maybe like, you remember, you know, have you ever seen the, the first time people saw like a movie, they saw a train coming towards them. Do you remember this Lumiere brothers kind of 18, in the 19th century, they showed a train coming. And people in the audience just run away. <laughs> Nowadays, we see the train coming, but we don't run away. We don't even dream to run away because we've learned that this is just a movie. So that's an example where you see like a life-threatening situation that you don't respond to. And that's, that's that kind of inhibition. You've learned, you've learned that a certain stimulus is not life-threatening or not threatening. So, so that's what the hippocampus knows how to do. And what gets um, apparently compromised in depression. It's not that you run away from a movie, but something different about the way you interpret. So basically it's it's specific for each person, for each experience. So maybe when you said that uh, they don't know what to do, so when you divide you by age, maybe there should be a factor because it depends. Like this, for example, or Some, yeah. something like that. Yeah, specific yeah. for each and every person. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you're saying maybe each person needs a different factor here. Yeah. Absolutely. And it, each kind of stress and each event. So maybe it's a good thing to say, and it, I didn't say it, so this all says now. We're dealing here in this lecture with a slightly different kind of model than we've dealt with before. It's a more abstract level, making huge reductions. Like what the hippocampus does is as rich as cognition. And we're characterizing it by one number, H. And that's a huge, huge reduction. And the, the payoff is that you can draw a two-dimensional graph and, and play with it to make a concept that hopefully survives into the real world. But the, that's very important to, to mention. And also, of course, now we'll talk soon about individuality, about different people, but each stimulus, each context, sometimes, um, like in post-traumatic stress disorder, you get suddenly very, very stressed because of some stimulus. You don't, you're not even aware, but it somehow reminds your 
amygdala and that, that you're in life danger and you don't even know. Maybe it's the sound of a, a door slamming or something, but you don't understand it's connecting to a very traumatic event. It bypasses your awareness and you just suddenly feel like life threatened. So it's very specific. Um, I can recommend, if you're interested, as an introduction, this book, book called Behave by Sapolsky. He was one of the people who studied baboons. And, uh, he wrote this really he amazing book, it's very big, about what's known, you can say, biologically, that can relate to uh, human behavior. And breaks it down to like the first second, you have like neurotransmitters, and the next second you have hormones, and then you have um, you have evolution of genes and you have cultures, like a lot of levels like that. It's so multidimensional. And I, I, I like that book a lot. It was recently published. More questions? Oh, there was a question about why isn't there an H here? Usually we put cells are made from cells. So it's that just reflecting the fact that in neurons you have stem cells and differentiated cells. And these stem cells, get, so the differentiated cells are the neurons and there's some production rate from the stem cells. But you can, you can, there's a lot of freedom in this part. You can write down models with H here, or with all kinds of carrying capacities. So that also give you, the, the important thing is to have curves that intersect at, at three points. So you, you need this kind of mathematical structure. This is just the simplest representation of the most basic solid biology without making any unneeded hypotheses. So maybe differentiation rates instead of stem cell division? Yeah, right, thank you. <laughs> Stem cell, it's not differ differentiation, right? Uh, uh, neuro, uh, yes, uh, neuro, 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 neuro generation, huh? Genesis. Neuro, neuro genesis, neurogenesis. So there's just a few uh, brain areas where that is um, reported to happen. Not, most brain areas don't, don't have uh, neurogenesis, but the hippocampus does. Okay. And that, that does not. Depend on the size of the hippocampus itself? Um, it's the number of stem cells, right? Yeah, the number of stem cells and the, the, some part of the, yes. Yeah, so. But yeah, let's say it's all scaled to the size of a human being, but well, you can add a dependence on the H and just make the model more complicated. It's not critical for Okay, let's take a nice deep breath. Now, the reason we worked hard to get this graph is because it, it, I like to use it to explain or to, to get a qualitative understanding for something. So for example, suppose now I change the parameters. What do we mean to change parameters? Suppose now I have a, a situation where this person has less neural death. So the alpha zero and alpha one parameters in this person are smaller. What's going to happen to the size of their hippocampus? It's going to be b bigger. So in certain people, maybe it looks like this, right? Or something about this null cline, something about this AA is different. And now this null cline moves here. So now we're talking about genetic differences, but the advantage is that we have some physiological parameters to look for what might be the, you know, these are like very coarse grained physiological parameters, like removal rate of neurons in some average way or functional mass, but at least it's a place to start. So, so this is a monostable situation, and it's a monostable situation where you have only the, the non-depressed state. Maybe that's like most people. And maybe this is like people that have the fragility or proneness to depression, even though they could be here all their life. And that's like one way to think about a, what's called um, susceptibility? Susceptibility? Susceptibility, right. So this could be a genetic difference. So that's point number one. It's like if you're uh, depressed to death, right? Super. 
C is likely to decrease with age. Great, great. C, uh, alpha, um, okay, C is likely to, so maybe you start out like this, and with age, you go to this. And this could be why depression has an age-related nature. So if you think about what aging does, it pushes the milk lines in this direction. For example, also the, um, also the, the, this parameter, which has to do with the ratio between the death and division rates of the adrenal cortex, also grows. So ratio of death and remove, uh, proliferation goes down. This thing should go up with age. Therefore, this thing should go down. I, I, I'm getting confused, but age pushes these, uh, these things together. So that's maybe for some people who are, so some people maybe are far and age doesn't make it, but for other people it does make it and suddenly you become, with age, susceptible. And then, right? So that's, that's like, absolutely. So you can reason about age dependence. Thanks. Okay. Which is, uh, makes this a threshold crossing phenomenon. And if you remember from our previous lectures, a threshold crossing phenomenon coupled with something like senescent cell dynamics can give you an exponentially rising incidence. And so we can maybe explain the age-related, some of the age-relatedness of depression. Okay, now let's talk about stress. Let's try to get to this uh, graph here, this theoretical graph here. What happens to, what does stress do? Uh, okay, let's start with a person that's not susceptible. S what stress does? Stress is here. So a H equals U over A. a to the Q. So if I increase U, I push stress, pushes this milk line up. That's what stress does. So a person with this kind of uh, no clients will have stress, will push the adrenal, you see the adrenal goes up, the adrenal goes up, the adrenal goes up, Hi hippocampus, doesn't ch uh, hippocampus doesn't change. When stress stops, no client goes back, you go back here. Right? That's what's called resilience, the steps, stress stops, and you go back, I mean, you have your stress behavior, you go back, your paper's been ejected, you mourn for a week, you continue the PhD. But the situation is drastically different if your no clients look like this. Because, okay, you start here in the non depressed state, and now you have a little bit of stress. That's fine. You still you can go back. But now you have more stress, and bam, you are here. But when you have more stress, this is no longer this is no longer a fixed point. The only fixed point, if this lasts long enough, is this one. This is the only fixed point. Remember, fixed points are where these lines cross, because that's where uh, both A and H don't change anymore. And that means that over weeks now. You go, you flow to here. So you cross some stress level and you flow to here. You explain yourself? Now what happens when the stress goes away? You go back to your original no plane, but now you're on this side. And you, you end up here. So the transient stress, if it's going on for long enough for you to Move here, if you, once you cross this cliff, you go back, you're gonna flow down here. This separatics. So you have this hysteretic situation where you have like a memory, you can say, of, uh, of where you were. And so I think this picture can explain or can offer a way to think about the difference between a person that's vulnerable and non-vulnerable to, to major depression. Questions about this? Yeah. 
Uh, what is the time dependency in this process? Yeah, because great. So what's the time dependency? It's very important. The time dependency has to do with the time scales in this uh, question. The time scales of neuron removal and the time scale of adrenal gland. So the time scale of adrenal gland we know from lecture for 60 days. And the time scale of the neuronal turnover, who knows? About like a few percent of the year. Who knows? <laughs> So it has a slow yeah, time scale. Yeah. Yeah, so. so it'll probably be dominated by this faster time scale. Turning in kind of, yeah. so I would say weeks. So what would happen is that the, the graph will immediately, because the pressure uh, is the stress. lower, then the graph will decrease, but the rate that the w we will uh, converge to the steady state will be in time stamps. Of weeks. Of weeks. So what, that, what this means is that if if the stress is high and you move to this, you start moving over weeks. Yeah. So if it's two days, it's not a problem. Okay. Three days, not a problem. But maybe a few weeks, once you cross into this region here, then, it, then it's over. You, you'll flow within weeks to this region. So maybe there'll be some slow dynamics of getting into the final depressed state of low hippocampus, high adrenal, high cortisol, but then you're, you're stuck there. Yes. And now, since we're going to talk about the long time scale of SSRIs, that's going to be the time scale. So I want to go to drugs against depression, but before that, more questions about this. Yeah. yeah. So for what age does the, 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 the risk for depression go up? If I remember correctly, we just looked at that from Kvat Kulim Klalit, all the depression codes. Yeah. It looks like, yeah, it goes, it goes up in childhood, reaches a plateau adulthood, and then like 60, 50, 60. 50 starts going exponentially, so it looks like this. But we'll have that graph for you in the lecture notes. So only for your eyes, because nobody's seen it before. From Patrick Clelit, no, other people have seen it, but not uh, first first time. This, but also, this whole theory is not published. It's all only for you. Just tell your best friends about it, okay? And anyone's watching, also, only for you, okay? And anyone you want to tell, it's okay. You can tell, but you choose who to tell, okay? So it's to share this with. Um, and the reason is because th this slow time scales have not been appreciated yet, I think, in medicine. And but they give, a, they give a, a, a testable theory for these slow time scales. Okay, so we talked about stress. Stress moves this null client. What about SSRI inhibitors and all those other medications, the drugs? So those drugs work on the brain, and they work on, so they increase uh, serotonin concentration. One, they do many things, but one thing in common to all these different kinds of medications is that they increase uh, neurogenesis. So we can put this parameter D here, or, or even, let's make it, let's add, add something. So we don't have to worry if drug equals zero. They add more neurogenesis, okay. And it, it doesn't really matter, as I'll show you. All they need to do is to move, they need to move this null client in the right direction, the right direction. So if I add a drug, I move this null client. So a person is depressed, right? This person is in this fixed point. Patient is this point. Now I add this drug. I move everything up. You know, I have to add it enough so that this point goes up, 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 up. When it kisses this line, that's when this unstable fixed point vanishes. And above that, you have only this fixed point. Only one fixed point. So now, it's the same question you asked, what's the time scale? The person now starts moving. It actually, I think, goes through this narrow channel here. Life is a very narrow bridge. 
And this takes weeks, like we said. And so that's one explanation for why this time scale. Because if you give it for too short a time, it, once you, if you stop taking the drug because of some side effect, let's say, it's, it's intolerable, no clients go back instantly because this, all these effects are drugs, so they work very quickly, and you flow back. But once you cross the separatrix, you now it's inevitable. If you, even if you go back, so that's maybe the time you can stop taking the drugs, right? It's a very precise time when you can stop taking the drugs. If you cross this point, you can drop it back down and you... So if you have the drugs, you flow to this point. If you stop the drug, you flow to this point. Did I explain myself? So that's like, makes some contradictions about a, a, like a critical time that afterwards you bound to heal, after, before that you bound to relapse and... Or Yeah, good point. So, why not, you asked, you're saying, as a therapeutic strategy, maybe we can push this thing back. That's great, right? So, another, a different therapeutic strategy is do something to the adrenal gland or to the HPA axis and move it back, like that. So, what would you need to do in order to do that? So, now we can look at this. Now we can design strategies, right? What, what, can, what, what can we affect here? We can affect this parameter and change it in the right direction. Out of all the parameters in this uh, problem, uh, there's only a few that are good therapeutic targets. So people have tried, people, I mean, researchers, clinical trials, to do all kind of agonists and antagonists of the HPA axis. But in my opinion, looking at these equations, it's actually most of them can't work because of the compensation properties. The glands grow and shrink in order to compensate for a lot of things you do to them. But I think playing with that parameter, which is, I don't know how to do it, let's say ratio of proliferation and removal of adrenal cells, could, uh, according to this picture, be a good possible way. So that's the way to kind of think of strategies and explain why some work and some don't work. So it's very good to have a model anyway. Of course, the model could be wrong either in a in a small way or in a big way, but at least it's a starting point. So that's an excellent, this is exactly the way of thinking. So maybe sometimes models decision making make, make you ask questions about therapies in a completely new way. So where do you see the difference between men and women? Why do women have 20% and men have 12%? True. Yeah. I mean, that's what I've read. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I'm really interested in that. So when you read, I've read that part of it is cultural and that in, and also in depression in women is somehow rising. And one explanation is cultural uh, statements like advertising that, sh so I, I told you like the baboons get depressed after losing to an alpha male. So imagine that every day some big guy would come and hit you like that, like good morning. <laughs> So imagine you're shown a picture of like a, a very like culture, what's, what's, cons what's the cultural messages are, this is what you're supposed to look like, or this is what you're supposed to be, all every day. You see 500 images like that. That's called advertising. So that's like one theory. So maybe there's more targeting of women in that way. But there's another biological reason, I think, and that has to do with the fact that in women, these glands, and maybe also that hypothalamus, ha um, are affected by the menstrual cycle. So it, women have monthly cycle, and that changes, I'll say this, that changes uh, a lot of, because of estrogen levels, they're changing, that changes cell division rate. So thyroid, adrenal, change and the hormone act set points change. And that means more cell division in women. Monthly? monthly. So in breast cancer that's very well known, and Luthi told me this fact, that if you have a delayed even the more delayed the more late your period starts, 
the lesser chance for breast cancer. You get it right? And the, the theory is that women have a lot of divisions in the breast cells in the menstrual cycle to adjust to the changing. And the more divisions, more mutations, more mutations, more cancer. So the less menstrual cycles you had, the less your chance of getting breast cancer. From this theory, you can predict also about this autoimmune diseases, like Addison disease, where autoimmune attacks to the adrenal happens more in women than in men. In, for instance, uh, thyroiditis, I think it's eight times more in women than in men. Women are sicker, but they live longer. Okay, so. <laughs> uh, and, we th and we think the reason is they have more divisions because of, uh, therefore they have more chance of mutation. Therefore you need more of this autoimmune surveillance I told you about in lecture three. Therefore they have more autoimmune disease. And you go disease by disease and you see more m women more than men, except for one, which is in the growth hormone axis, which is more men than women. Because as we said in the last lecture, men have higher growth rates and reach higher heights. And so they have something about their growth. So I think that's about gender medicine. And if you look at that, this AA will be different in men and women because it has to do with divisions and death in the adrenal. So it could be that the explanation is a shift in this null claim, making it more likely to intersect three times. So that's like a biological theory based on first principles. Let's take a nice deep breath. <sighs> so gender medicine. So until recently, it was normal to do your experiments on, only on men and to give drugs for men and also to women, right? The same position. Now it's uh, dawned uh, with the changes in the last, since Bob Dylan, since Martin Luther King, and since um, feminism. Why have I said two men now? So since, what's the name of a feminist woman? Change agent. Huh? When women take these pills, so it also changes everything. When women take these pills? Ah, anti pregnancy, anti con contraceptive. Yeah, the contraceptives, um, they definitely affect cortisol. That's for sure. We know because when we dealt with potholing plalit and we wanted to look at cortisol, we had to take away all drugs that interfere, that change cortisol, and contraceptives are, are big ones. So, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember now. Do you remember? Contraceptive? Compensated? Okay. So, in fact, in Kupat Kholin Kulalit data, so nobody tests for cortisol. It's rare, but there's still um, 100,000 tests uh, for people without diagnosis of a disease that affects cortisol. It's rare, but it's, it's, uh, it's less than you know, other blood like TSH, you have more than 10 million. Okay, so gender medicine, right? Very important that we mentioned it. Um, but I'm not, now I'm blanking on the names of the feminists that I, I, wa I want to mention, some heroes. What, what do you think? Me, me at Timothy. Huh? Oh, we're celebrating 100 years to the vote for women. 1919, England, after World War I, women joined the workforce. They made a deal with the Prime Minister. We're not going to strike. We're going to help you in the war. We need the vote. They got the vote. Okay. World War I, big change for the workers, for women, for social rights. Okay. Look. Uh, that's a hundred years ago, right? Now it's 2019. Um, all right, so we have a picture where we can um, at least, you know, or at least build the conceptual tools where we can discuss what might happen. Why is it that drugs, so why is it, what could be the reason that some people are susceptible and not susceptible? Why is it that stress can either make, you can be resilient or cross over to another state depending on on your null clients. What physiological parameters might be good targets for treating depression? How drugs that work very quickly on the neurotransmitters take weeks to work on the mood? Yeah. All these together in a, in a kind of a geometric picture, and that's 
that's something you can work with to generate ideas. Right? So uh, chronic stress, we said SSRIs. So I think time to take a nice deep sigh of relief. <sighs> and uh, remember uh, how to support people that are around you, uh, that are uh, ill. And uh, any, any more questions before we uh, break? What do you think? Any comments about this theory? Huh? Yeah, is it, so mice, right, so a lot of research on depression is in mice. Instead of cortisol, they have a slightly different, they have cortis, cortisol zone. But they're the same HPA axis, and, they, and a lot of things actually come from mice, you know. A lot of this information from rodents, the cortisol is neurotoxic, and a lot of comes from rodents. So what kind of experiment would you do in, in, in rodents? How can you do this? Huh? How can you do this? How what? Culturally resistant. Culturally resistant? Yeah, I mean, you try to do it in a different culture. So, you know, you, you can... Different cultures, yeah, different cultures deal with depression. So some, some cultures, it's, uh, it's a lot of the social ties so strong that a lot of this is less of a overt problem. I think in, in, in our society where social ties are weak and weak and weak, we expose a lot of more vulnerabilities. So social ties, Reduce stress. Hello. It's a very important uh, component. And sometimes they make stress, right? But sometimes they give you ulcers. But I'm talking about the good kind of social ties that are supportive and, uh, and meaning making. All right. Um, don't worry about a thing. Every little thing is gonna be all right. Okay, the class is officially over. <laughs> About a thing. Next time, uh, goodbye party, right? We'll l learn one final topic. Uh, it'll be fun. The course is almost over. It's very sad for me. I love, uh, love teaching this with you. I learn a lot from you. And I wish you a nice week. If anybody want to talk to me, I'm here. Okay.